Today I've been thinking about the word pride. Now when you hear the word pride, I'm guessing one of two things comes to your mind. And they're probably it's probably either good or bad. You may think pride means things like I take pride in myself. I take pride the way I look or the way I dress to make sure I'm looking and dressing my best. I am so proud of my children. They're so amazing. The things that they're able to accomplish it just fills me with pride. I am proud to be an American. When I look at the flag, it just brings such pride to my heart. I am so proud when I see my daughters excel at ballet and dance. They are so amazing. I am so proud that my son is the star football player. I am proud of the accomplishments of my children. Or if you're like, you know, the older group of us, <clears throat> I'm so proud to be a grandfather. Well, and these, these are all common things. These are things that, that we all do and say all the time, but we probably think Using the word pride is so innocuous, there's nothing wrong with being prideful. Actually, that seems different when you use the word prideful instead of pride. So I thought what I'd do is, let's start today, but I, I want to look up the definition of pride in the dictionary. Because... What I want to talk about today, about pride, might surprise you based on how I kind of opened this segment. So according to the dictionary, pride, the first definition, a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether as cherished in the mind or as displayed in bearing, conduct, etc. Number two definition, the state of feeling or being proud. Remember, we're so proud of our children. <clears throat> Number three, a becoming or dignified sense of what is due to oneself or one's position or character, self-respect, self-esteem. Now, self-esteem and self-respect are so important. So, pride goes along with that, right? It just helps us have that self-respect and self-esteem. Number four, pleasure or satisfaction taken in something done by or belonging to oneself or believed to reflect credit upon oneself. See, when you say you're proud of your children, your accomplishments, you know what you're really saying? I'm proud of myself. Those kids wouldn't be here if it wasn't for me. Uh, frankly, they wouldn't be as successful in sports or ballet if it wasn't for me because I spent a lot of money getting them to practices and so on and so on. So when you say you're proud of your children, what you're doing is you are trying to take credit for their accomplishments. All right, now bear with me because I know there's a lot of people that are going to say, Phil, <clears throat> this is such a stretch. What you're doing is such a stretch. So I thought it would be interesting to go to the Bible dictionary and read the heading on pride. So here's what I found. Pride. A lack or absence of humility or teachableness. What does the Savior say about being teachable? He told his apostles, humble yourselves like little children so you can be teachable. Pride sets people in opposition to each other and to God. If you're proud that your team won or that your kids won, that means you're opposing the other kids. Now, I'm not saying that there's not winners and losers in life. I'm not saying that at all because there are. We're all either a winner or a loser at some point in our life. The next one, a proud person sets himself above those around him and follows his own will rather than God's will. Can you have pride and not be prideful? Think about that one for a minute. Conceit, envy, heart-heartedness, and haughtiness are also typical of a proud 
person. So on the line of pride, I looked up some scriptures in the Old Testament. The scriptures are filled with references to pride, but I thought we'd start with the Old Testament. So let's go to uh, the first one I have here is Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. You've probably all heard this one, right? Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. Hmm. Let that one sink in. <clears throat> Let's do Malachi, the very last book in the Old Testament. Most of us, when we, when we read Malachi, we think of tithing. Pay your tithing or you'll be burned, right? The last chapter in the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. That means they're gone. There's nothing left. They have no future, no root or branch. A couple more. Now, I realize that um, there are going to be those in my audience that are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I'm going to use a couple of scriptures you may not be familiar with. These are in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to try to convert you, but you will appreciate these scriptures because they're teachings of the Savior, so they're things that you'll be familiar with. In the book of Alma, chapter 5, verse 28, Alma says, Behold, ye are stripped of pride. I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. And then the last one, and like I said, there are many. I just chose a few. This is in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 38, verse 39. And if ye seek the riches, which is the will of the Father to give unto you, you shall be the richest of all people, for ye shall have the riches of eternity. Now, he's not talking about earthly riches. He's talking about spiritual riches. And it must needs be that the riches of the earth are mine to give. But beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. And those of us who know this reference, the Nephites started out as a pretty amazing, incredible people who had great faith and love and respect and for the Lord and kept the commandments. But because of pride, they were utterly destroyed, completely wiped off of the map. So, pride. Is there, is there any good pride? I know some of you are saying, yeah, but there's, there's good pride. There's good pride. <clears throat> is there good murder? In the Ten Commandments, a, section, a, a statement of beliefs that all Christian churches adhere to, one of the commandments we read as, Thou shalt not kill, but the actual translation in Hebrew is, Thou shalt not murder. There's a big difference between killing and murdering. You may kill in self-defense. You may kill because the Lord commanded you to, like we know the Lord did all throughout the Old Testament. But murder is different. So is there good murder? No, there's no good murder, ever. Murder is bad. It's prohibited in one of the general beliefs of all Christianity in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not murder. Years ago, I taught seminary, and one of the things, the lessons I taught, and I don't know who came up with this. I'm not going to claim credit for it. It's kind of a fun little thing <clears throat> to think about when you're thinking about pride. If you look at the word pride, P-R-I-D-E, what do you find right in the middle of the word pride? I. I is always in the middle of pride. It's all about me. I'm so proud of the things I've accomplished. So if you're not convinced on how I feel about pride, I've got one last thing I want to do that hopefully will kind of push you over the edge. 
So I've got a handful of scriptures in the New Testament. Some of these scriptures are accounts that took place at the baptism of our Savior Jesus Christ, where a voice was heard from heaven. That's when our Father in heaven introduced his Son. The next set of scriptures take place on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and his apostles. Again, when they heard a voice from heaven, the voice of God the Father, introducing his Son. But I made one small change in these scriptures, and I want to see if you can catch where it is. Let's start with the baptism of Jesus, Matthew 3.17. Here's the scripture, and I'm using the King James Version. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and I am so proud of him. Mark 1.11, the same account, only from Mark. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son, and I am so proud of you. Now, the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5. While he yet spake, this is Jesus, while Jesus yet spake, Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, and I am so proud of him. And the last one, 2 Peter 1.17, again talking about the same experience the Men of Transfiguration says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, and I am so proud of him. Okay, I made this real obvious, I know. I made it real obvious. But sometimes that's what you have to do to get people to think about it. What is the word God always, always, always uses instead of pride? This word changes the whole context, the whole meaning. He says, Behold my beloved Son, in whom I... I am well pleased. You see, when you're pleased with something, that's a good thing. When you're pleased that your children have excelled in dance or sports or scholastics, that's a good thing. Because you're not saying it's because of me. You're pleased because your children were able to use their talents and work hard and accomplish something. So as a parent, you're pleased that they did that. Our Father in Heaven never ever used the word proud. But you know who did? Satan. Satan. I'm telling you that pride is the root of all evil. In the very beginning, Lucifer, the son of the morning, He decided that he had learned everything he possibly could from God. He'd learned it all. Follow me. Give me the glory. It was his pride that destroyed him. It was his pride that caused God to send him, to cast him, and one-third of the host of heaven who followed him to earth, to be imprisoned on earth until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pride is not a good thing. Pride is not a good word. You won't find anywhere in the scriptures where pride is used as a positive word. So my challenge to you today is to replace the word pride with the word pleased. And you may discover how different you feel because then you're giving credit where credit is due. When you accomplish something you've worked really hard on, you're pleased. I would assume that prior to that accomplishment, you were probably on your knees a lot, begging and pleading with the Lord to help you, whether it was to excel in a class, graduate, um, to give a talk in church, or to deal with a wayward child. You can be pleased with the things you accomplish and still be humble. But you can't be prideful and humble at the same time. It's like darkness and light. They cannot exist at the same time. 
The last thing I want to mention in this video is that I'm in the process of writing a new book series called Return from Risa. I'm writing it with a good friend of mine, Rick Nelson. And there's a concept in the book that we talk about called Perbia. Now, we're writing this book, our primary audience are the millennials, the kids that are the age of my kids. And we wanted to find a way to tell a story about the plan of salvation, about the goodness of God and the grace of Christ and the plan of salvation without being preachy. And we decided not to use the word pride, which is a real, uh, which is throughout the entire book. It will be part of the entire series. Instead, we use the word perbia. Perbia is pride. So I hope that you've learned something, that you've been able to take something from this. Uh, feel free to make some comments, some comments below. Um, feel free to shoot me a message on your thoughts about pride. And uh, thanks again for watching.